interesting things that have happened that you think we should know about. Consider how much of your life depends on space. When I think about scientists who are household names, how did you break through? I didn't start out saying I want to be a famous scientist. I want to be a good scientist. Mm. Oh, you go to Harvard. I didn't give a rat's ass. Oh! Yeah, I said it. Snack! Hey family, it's Carlos Watson. Got one of the best known scientists in the world stopping by, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Now you know him, you know that voice, you know his wonderful science always makes you feel like you're learning. But now we get the backstory on how this New York kid became one of the world's best known faces. Tune in. The Carlos Watson Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance. Hey Neil, it's Carlos Watson. Hey Carlos, pleasure to meet you. Yeah, same, where are you in this uh, crazy, wonderful world. I'm based in New York City, but right now I'm out on Long Island, trying to stay safe. Good, good. Have you been healthy the whole way through, I hope? Yeah, thanks for asking. Yes, as has my whole family. I think we're staying healthy because we're heeding the advice of medical professionals. What are two or three things when you talk about spreading scientific knowledge that you hope that those of us who are everyday people that we may have missed, but interesting things that have happened over the last year, last few years that you think we should know about. Consider how much of your life depends on space right now. You're probably not thinking about that. Um, from hailing an Uber or Lyft, uh, how do you get that? Oh, well, you just sent a signal to a satellite that gave your coordinates relative to a nearby car. Another one is, oh, let me swipe right, okay? <laughs> and who is that person? That's someone who a GPS satellite has established is within three blocks of you. Oh, is there a bar nearby? Okay, let's find that. So, so much of people's lives today are enabled and empowered by space. So that when I hear someone say, why are we up in space when we have problems here on Earth? We gotta solve the Earth problems first. And I've said this many times and maybe it's not enough. Let's go back 30,000 years and roll in the cave, okay? And someone peeks out the front door of the cave and sees a mountain, a valley, a hill, a stream. And it tells the people, I wanna go out there and explore this. No. We have cave problems. We have to solve the cave problems first before you exit the front door, okay? If, so you saying, we got earth problems, let's solve the earth problems before we step off of this speck we call earth into the vastness of the universe. And if that's what you're saying, you sound like that person in the cave to me. To believe that all of our answers can be found on this third rock from the sun, when the vast greater universe lay undiscovered before us, um, is naive at best, and it's dangerous at worst. Asteroid alert! NASA is tracking multiple asteroids approaching Earth's orbit at unimaginable speeds. Who better to ask about this phenomenon than Neil deGrasse Tyson, astrophysicist? My favorite astrophysicist. I'm not going to be the first on any of those voyages until, like, Elon Musk sends his mother. Get over it. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> Pluto had it coming. How many astrophysicists do you know? If I'm your favorite, I don't what? even know what that means. I don't want to know any others, oh. Neil. You understand? I don't remember my old girlfriends. I don't remember the old astrophysicists okay. before I met you. Where did you grow up? Are you a New York City kid? Uh, yeah, New York City, born and raised. All my formative years were in the Bronx. Did you wander away from the city at, at some point on your way to, to becoming who you were? Or, or did you kind of stay in the city the whole way through? Uh, college and graduate school. Um, I, I went up to Boston to attend Harvard, majored in physics. Uh, then I began graduate school uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, but then changed to Columbia. So I was back in Manhattan, back in New York City for the completion of the PhD. And then I left again to go to Princeton, uh, did a postdoc there, but then returned back to the city when the American Museum of Natural History decided it wanted to do something with the then aging Hayden Planetarium. And so I agreed to come in and help that out. And ultimately I was appointed to an endowed chair as director of the facility. And by the way, that was my, and that was my first night sky, was the night sky of the Hayden Planetarium. Because oh. as a city kid, no one in the city has any kind of relationship with stars or the sun, moon, and planets. Because you look up and there's a building, you look up a little higher, there's like light pollution. And when I grew up, there was air pollution. And so the planetarium became my portal and huh. my conduit to the cosmos at a very early age. So if you sort of package the whole 
story is like hometown kid comes back you know to lead the institution that so influenced him and i try to tell that to people and they just don't care <laughs> I think it works better in a small town than in a big town. Not just saying. But I love the story, though, because I was surprised. I don't know why. I didn't expect you to be a New York City kid. Were you kind of a second-generation scientist, or did you find your own path to the stars? It was my own path. My father, he's degreed in sociology, and he went on to work under Mayor Lindsay during the heat of the civil rights movement and the assassinations. My mother was a housewife and she raised me and my brother and sister until we were mostly empty nest and then she went back to school and got a degree in gerontology the people who study aging and and the needs and 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 wants of the elderly my parents were both focused on supporting those in need and here's their son the astrophysicist <laughs> so that was a little weird right um but i credit my parents, we were exposed to um, uh, things grown-ups do who love their jobs. Two weekends a month, uh, the five of us went on trips to the aquarium, the, the art museum, the science museum, the natural history museum, the planetarium. Right. But we also went to sporting events, uh, the opera. So we got to broaden the options that you might imagine you might become when you grow up by seeing adults as experts in these multiple fields. My brother ended up as an artist and he illustrated two of my books, actually. <laughs> I can say without hesitation that my heart has been in the universe uh, ever since I was nine years old. What happened at nine? The singular sort of turning point was a trip to the Hayden Planetarium, family trip when I was nine years old. My first telescope was when I was 12. It was a gift from my parents once they saw my interest that had germinated from age nine. What were you like as, as, a, as a kid here? Were you a quiet kid loving the planetarium? Were you a loud kid who who put his energy into this? I had total geek credentials, but I, but I didn't read as a geek um, to others just because I was bigger. And later on, I would study martial arts and take up wrestling. So I was pretty physically able to defend myself and others if I saw the need. Our home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully. Dream fearlessly. What were your years at Harvard like? Was it the perfect place for you? My awareness kicked in in the early 70s where there was extensive social and cultural unrest because of school busing in multiple places, and it especially hit Boston. So Boston was an entirely unwelcoming city for anyone, particularly certain neighborhoods, for anyone of any kind of skin color, darker than loose leaf paper. There was not a three days would go by before someone just in the street would just call out the N word or, or toss something at me. That was the climate. And so I was only really sort of safe from that on the Harvard campus among others. The moment I stepped off campus, I'm on guard the whole time. I didn't really care that it was Harvard. I know that sounds weird. Um, all I cared was that the school I went to had an excellent astrophysics program. And so it was like, I'm going to Harvard. I don't care that it's the oldest college or it's fancy or that, oh, you're going to Harvard. I didn't give a rat's ass because my cosmic ambitions were so deeply embedded that was my priority did you enjoy it uh, uh were you a fish out of water when i was in graduate school and i gave uh, the help sessions to classes uh, before the next exam um they were very heavily attended like more people attended my help sessions than the main lecture given by the professor uh, and so this got written up in the campus newspaper um, pe people go to Tyson sessions because they're fun and interesting and you learn and they, so so I did that for several years. You loved it like Kobe loved basketball. Why do you love astrophysics so much? I have a, a weak answer and I have a strong answer for you. So my weak answer is at age nine when I looked up at the dome of the planetarium and the stars came out, I think the universe called me and I had no say in the matter. Really it was looking up into that projected night sky, seeing the immensity of it and realizing, oh my gosh, there's still so much to learn, so much to discover. I want to be on that frontier 
as is true for most, if not all scientists, you're attracted to the unknown. W which scientist do you admire the most, either alive or, or dead? My favorite scientist is Isaac Newton for what he achieved very quickly in his lifetime, what he wrote, how he thought. If you read his writings, this man was connected to the cosmos. Talk to me about Cosmic Queries. Uh, uh, why did you write it? And, uh, and, and what for you was the most interesting part of writing that book? The book, Cosmic Queries, is the sort of printed spinoff, if you will, of a one of the formats of my podcast, which is called Star Talk. That quark or whatever, where does it go? When I look away and it's now in a different place, where did it go? And in that podcast, um, it inverts the, the journalistic model where you, know, you might think of a, a science program where the journalists interview scientists every week. This inverts that where I'm the scientist and I'm the host and I interview people hewn from pop culture. Oh! Snap. It feels the energy and it kicks it into another place. Exactly. Hold steady. Bing. It's not there anymore. And the conversation explores all the ways that science has touched their lives. One of the more popular formats of that show is called Cosmic Queries, where we solicit questions from our fan base. And if we're soliciting sort of uh, astronomical questions, then it's just me and my co-host, who's a professional comedian, by the way. And the comedian is there to offer a force of levity to balance the force of gravity of the scientific content. I love the way that you integrate, as you said, pop culture, unexpected people, and personalities and everyday events with these kind of big uh, questions. On this show, we're always talking about dreaming fearlessly and what people have learned and what their path is, has been. How did you break through? How did you, because when I think about scientists who are household names in America today, there are like really very few scientists who are household names. Most of what you see of me in the world today was never my goal. I didn't start out saying I want to be a famous scientist. I want to be a good scientist. I want to make discoveries like any scientist who's coming up in the ranks. Uh, I want to be able to publish research papers. So those were my goals. What started happening was, especially being based in New York City, where it's a, it's a news gathering headquarters, there's always something cosmic happening. So we, we tend to be have a little extra socialization because the public and the press comes to us when these events happen. In New York City, they came to the head of the planetarium. They didn't know me from anything, but I had title. So they'd come and I'd give them a good soundbite. So I thought to myself, this is a good way to just sort of share my love of science. As Carl Sagan said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. And so that grew. And by the way, it grew steadily. And then it transcends from, from the evening news to talk shows or to documentaries and I get interviewed for those. And so it's, it's a slow build, but then it just continues as sort of the same slope as before, maybe a little higher slope. I wanna try a little something I like to call rapid fire, kind of my version of Cosmic Query. It's not quite, but uh, uh, but I'm gonna call it rapid fire. And, 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 and I <laughs> it's a laugh, wait, wait, is it rapid fire because you're asking short questions or is it rapid fire because you're expecting me to give short answers? Short answers, but what I love about you is that you always have your Isaac Newton on, which is you're always queering the query. I love that. What's your favorite TV show? Uh, the Twilight Zone, by far. Ooh. The storytelling, the acting, the cinematography, the the fact that they're all sort of short stories with a twist at the end. Um, I thought it's the best television ever made, not only at the time, but even ever since. Sooner or later, will all of us be on the menu? All of us. Wait, you're going back to your boy Rod Serling, or you're doing the more uh, more recent no, version? No, of course, all the way, okay. all the way. 19, late 50s, early 60s, Rod Serling. Which, contrary to Mr. Wilson's plan, happens to be in the darkest corner of the Twilight Zone. A uh, favorite place you've ever been? Uh, favorite place uh, I've ever been is the the summit of Cerro Tololo Observatory. Uh, that's in Chile, where I did I gathered the data for my PhD thesis. Neil deGrasse Tyson, I so appreciate you. I, I love this conversation, uh, and I hope you'll come back again. Hope this won't be the only visit. Thanks for this invitation, and it's great to get to meet you and know you, and I, I'm, you 
put me on your Rolodex. That's fine. Who wants to get in on some Neil? I thought he was going to say instead of Twilight Zone, Star Trek, the original Star Trek. I did too. The language he uses, it's yeah. like the same language. You know, it's that astrophysicist language. I'm surprised that he didn't say that. Yeah. I do. I have. The original Twilight Zones have a big place in my heart. That was that was a big choice. He's wrong, but that was a big choice. <laughs> that, that was a big choice. Uh, Marco, you want in on this? He's like a um, Stephen Hawking's v. James Earl Jones. <laughs> oh, oh. And so he sets you up. Yeah. And then he slingshots you into the air with like this beautiful expression of how he sees the alignment of the cosmos. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'd never met him before, was very intrigued to meet him. He really caught my attention when he said, space is more connected to your everyday life than you know, whether you're getting an Uber, whether you're sending an email, what have you. Hadn't thought about it that way, very intriguing to hear. I was surprised to hear him say that he hadn't broken big in a moment, but rather that it had been gradual. You know, if you enjoyed this conversation with Neil, remember he's got a wonderful new book called Cosmic Query, so you can get more of him, and you can get more of us. You can subscribe to the show. You can listen to our beautiful podcast. And if you're really a friend, you'll tell a friend. Hey, as we wrap our show, I wanted to take a minute to show off my new favorite cakes. Now, that's right. I want you to take a look at these that come courtesy of my friends at Carioma. And if you like what you see, these very cool new Brazilian shoes, guess what? You can pick them a pair as well. Just visit carioma.com slash Carlos and hook yourself up. All right, that's going to be it for us today. Thanks to Neil for stopping by the show. Really appreciate it. And to all of you for doing the same. Hey, if you like what you're seeing, you're also going to like this year's Aussie Fest. That's right. It's coming to you virtually on May 15th and 16th, Saturday and Sunday. This year, we've got an incredible lineup, and we're also partnering with our friends at the United Negro College Fund. We're going to donate ticket proceeds to some of the brightest and best historically black college and university students all across the country. So visit Ozzy.com for more. And you know, before you do that, make sure you subscribe here. Tell your friends about this. I'll see you soon.